Brian Holtzman, ladies and gentlemen. Brian motherfucking Holtzman. Yay! In my living room with your Gene Autry belt on. How you doing, Tom? Good to be here. I'm glad I'm here. Thanks for the opportunity. And you don't, you're not in 818, so this is great. Do you live over in the 818? No. No. I don't like the 818. I don't like the valley. Oh, I see. Yeah. The valley. <laughs> it all looks the same. You know, every intersection is the same. Yeah. And hot as hell. Where do you live in? Hollywood? Redondo Beach. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I used to live next to Pink Dot, remember? They're finally taking that building down. That, oh, and that, that old <laughs> ass building. No <laughs> shit. Yeah. You lived right there? Many years. Wow, no shit. Debauchery. Debauchery Central. <laughs> did you uh did, did did you partake in some debauchery? Then? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes, it was unavoidable. It was unavoidable. So you you were, you were playing at the comedy store? Right. And you just like what? Bring ladies back there, bring drugs back there. <laughs> well, the drugs were already there. I think it was a, a manufacturing hub. But uh yeah, you know. What kind of people lived in that building? All sorts of old people. There was one lady. You got the pink dot and then there's a weird little street and then it's that first odd little building there. Right. Yeah, that was it. So yeah. what kind of people lived there? No, uh, uh, prostitutes and whores and uh, writers and uh, uh, musicians. So you didn't have to go very far. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. Brian, I'm 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 a fan. I love you, and I I uh, whenever you're on, like if I'm gonna leave, I'll like if I see that you're gonna be on at the comedy store, I always stay because I love watching you. And the way that I just have described you to people. Um, is he's a man on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Would you would would, would that be an accurate description? Somebody described it as uh, somebody who's uh, uh, angry or ranting about a, a changing world that that he's not comfortable with. Perhaps. Yeah, like, remember that, uh, uh, the Michael Douglas movie... Falling Down. Falling Down. You're like that guy without the gun. Dice wanted me to go on the road <laughs> for him a long time ago, and he wanted me to dress up like that character. And that kind of turned me off. I, I didn't want to have a costume. Yeah. So that didn't go. But I love that, you, I love that you're yelling, and you get pissed, and it's like things uh, drive you to your wit's end, like yeah. in your comedy. I mean, yeah. is 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 this manufactured, or are you like constantly? No, the only times it everything? the only times it works is when it's 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 real passion. People confuse passion with anger. Anger's you can see through anger and it goes away, but passion never goes away. You know, you have your passion for your books; that's never going to go away. It's the same thing with the, you know, the yelling that people think I'm yelling. No, it's more it's more deep than that. So, so, you know, how do you, you're always doing different material. I mean, like, so, I mean, what do you do? Read the paper every day and you just get pissed uh, off? Uh, well, newspapers are in history. There are no more. Well, I see you got excited because I have the Week wait, magazine yeah, this here. Good. I get and this I want to give uh, Carla in Rochester, one of my uh, supporters of the podcast, she turned me on to this magazine, the one and only time I ever played in Rochester, New York. I got to the club early and she was sitting at the bar. And I'm like, what are you reading? And she was like, oh, The Week. I was like, what is that? She's like, you don't know what The Week is? She goes, here, take this. And she gave me this magazine. And I had never heard of it before. And I have been a fan of The Week magazine since the day she handed me that magazine. And I've, I've given so many subscriptions to people. I like, what you, I like what you just said because they give a breakdown of both sides of both the news. Sides. They'll show what the conservative... Uh, media saying and then they'll say what the, and the liberal media is saying and I found after you read it and you, you you read both opinions on a particular item you're scratching your head and you're going that well they both have valid reasons so it's it's you know you really have to have an open mind because uh, you know it's just uh, right down the middle yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I uh, has a valid, you know, there's conservative people in my family. I've given them gifts uh, of this magazine, and uh, they don't see any other way but their own opinion. Right. You know, like, I remember the El Paso shooting happened last month, and then one of the things in there was uh, the liberals are all crying that this was Trump's fault. And I'm like, 
oh, I, I think it kind of is Trump's fault. But they were they gave both sides of the coin, and it mm. made me consider um, the other viewpoint. I got this originally from my sister Sue. She gave me a birthday present and a subscription, and that's how I got turned on to it. That's a great gift. And then I, oh, I ordered it ever since. I like it's a good week for, it's a bad week for. Yeah. And then uh, it wasn't all bad, and then it'll give like a little good news. And then I love the um, the houses in the back. It's always right, the real estate <laughs> steal steal the week steal the week. Have you ever called any of the... No, heck no. There was one in uh, New Mexico a few years ago I called, and it had been, and then one in Austin, and they had been sold before the magazine went right. out. But um, now, what year, what year did you have your television show? Because that's when I remember you when I first... So I've been a fan of yours for many years. You had long hair, yep. and you had a major... Uh, Three-letter network television show. <laughs> remember? Yeah, I remember. What year was uh, that? 19... So I can see where I was. 96 to 97. Where were you? Uh, I was in L.A., yeah. I got to L.A. in 1989, right after the big earthquake in San Francisco during the World Series. Remember that? I remember well. I moved to San Francisco the next year, yeah. in 1990. So uh, so I, I already planned to move to L.A. A lot of people think I was running away because of the earthquake. That's That's not true. But now, so you're you're from Long Island, right? You were in the Air Force, four and, and a half years. Four and a half years. I was a major. Get the fuck out! You were a major in the Air Force. A major fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see? You, we let me go get some. I got an honorable. I let, got an honorable. Let me get some touch. pliers so you can get that fish hook out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, what was your rank? Uh, I was a sergeant, and then I uh, I got busted down to a senior airman. Why'd you get busted? Uh, we went to Korea for a, uh, an exercise, and uh, in Korea they had this this drink. It's like sake. It's clear. It's called soju. Yeah, they sell it at Dodger Stadium. And uh, you, you can drink it very fast, and all of a sudden it's like a bolt of lightning. <laughs> <laughs> and I got shit faced and. I refused to show my ID, and they had to ship me out on the next plane the next morning. So, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> what was your? It always, what was it your always built this down to debauchery. Uh, I was sergeant, and then I lost my sergeant stripe, so I, I went down to senior airman. I think it was. Fuck. So I got off the plane, and they flew me to Seoul, and then they got off the plane in Okinawa, and they were all standing there waiting. They said, Sergeant, you go back to the barracks and you don't leave the barracks unless you have to eat. It's just like a comical movie. What did you get out of the Air Force? What was the biggest lesson you got? Travel and meeting all people from all over the United States and all the different personalities. And I knew I wasn't going to college and I knew I wasn't going to stay in Long Island in my poor father's house, the youngest of seven, you know. <laughs> you know, you can tell when, you know, you're not wanted, so to speak, you know. I mean, the guy's burnt out. So I knew, so I followed in the footsteps of my brother Jay. He was He's in the Air Force. Air Force brochures on your bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just praying. And funny story, uh, I, my first base was McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. So he thought he was getting rid of me. Every weekend, <laughs> I was coming off. <laughs> He used to say, you have, you, you're, you have your ass in a tub of butter, he used to say. <laughs> so uh, the Air Force was good. It was what was sporting. your dad like? He was a fireman. And he was, uh, in, in World War II, he got stationed in New Orleans in the medical department. And he has these letters that we made a book out of that he wrote my mom back then. Wow. And they're very interesting, and there's a lot of, uh, if you read between the lines, he was stationed in New Orleans in the... And he became a first sergeant, but he really didn't like the attitudes, the racism that was very prevalent then. Mm -hmm. And he uh, indicates that in his, uh, you didn't care for New Orleans whatsoever. Yeah. And then he got out and then he got a job with the, back then you didn't go to college, you got a job. And he got a job with the New York City Fire Department. I think your dad's a... On, yeah, on his way here. On his way. <laughs> oh, isn't that nice, huh? That there was a shooting right in front of my building last night. Again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I was walking home. Uh, I did a set. There was some the open mic night on Melrose, and I was walking back, and uh, the, it was, the the corner was taped off. And mm, it's too bad. Yeah. yeah. Thought I lived in a good neighborhood. Like they say, there are no safe places. Even that guy, that poor that poor actor who got slayed in his own bed. News radio. Who was that? Uh, uh, what was his name? News radio. Uh... Bogosian? No, no, no. That no, was talk radio. News radio, the television show. Oh yeah, the uh, the Phil Hartman. And that was so sad. Well, he was killed by his coke. Yeah, uh, in his own wife. bed. You think you're safe in your own bed? You know when you're yeah. you always say, you know, I'm in my bed. You know what can happen? That was terrible. So uh, then he became a fireman, and then he retired uh, after 20 years as a lieutenant, and then he got a job at the Social Security Administration because he wanted regular weekends off. So he did that until he retired, and he was a big reader. He used to work, uh, he used to advise the people at Doubleday. He was real friends with Doubleday, the book publishing wow. company, on uh, when their employees would be the best time for them to collect Social Security and whatnot. You know, people really want to figure out what this deal is before they retire, you know, because a lot of it is once you make a decision, it's, 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 it's in stone. So they would give him beautiful books, beautiful books, big books, Table, coffee table books. And that was a that was quite a perk. And, and uh, they wrote him a beautiful letter when he retired. And then... Uh, what kind of books did he like? Uh, novels. Probably novels, I would say. What kind of books do you like? I like, uh, I like them all. I like a good book. And you can find a good book with a novel. You can find... A, uh, biographies are great. Uh... uh one of the best books I recommend to everybody is uh, The Memory of Running. I've heard of that. I know. Oh, man, you got to read that one, Tom. You'll love it. What a story. You just miss it. That's what I... People left, don't... right, left, right, left, right, left, right. The Memory of Running. Right. <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> but uh, people, people don't understand about books. <clears throat> you, you will never get the same feeling from a... A movie that you get from a book. Yeah, I agree. You'll miss the book. Like I'm a big fan of Steinbeck, uh, John Steinbeck, East of Eden. The well, movie. That's one. The movie with James Dean. It's only like the first hundred and fifty pages. It's a four hundred page book, or three hundred and seventy five. You know, I should. Like, so much shit happens after where the movie ends. If you would have been a fan of that book when that movie would have came out, you went, "What the fuck is this garbage?" It's uh. It's, uh, I wish I had brought my little thing. Whenever I finish reading a book, I started in the Air Force. I write it down in the author and the date that I finished it. And I would have been able to tell you all the authors. Uh, who's the guy who talks about the, uh, the churches, the big thick books? What's his name? Short-term memory is a real bitch. But, um, talks about churches? Yeah, what's his name? Um, uh, he has a few books. He writes a lot of books. Uh, you know, he goes into periods and characters, you know, based on uh, real occurrences. That guy. You're talking about Dan Brown? That Not Dan Brown. Dan Brown repeats himself continuously as you turn the pages. He keeps repeating what you already know. I'm not a big fan of the way he's writing lately. You know, you turn the page and you read the same thing that you already know previously. Yeah. Finally, some Brian Holtzman anger. He, uh, he, you know, Dan Brown. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, it has I, to be I, genuine, Tom. It has to be genuine. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, uh, of Dan Brown. I read that, uh, that book that was really popular, whatever. Like The one about the religion and the Catholic thing. and all The Tom Hanks thing. movie. Right. Yeah. The, uh, they were looking after some shiny object or something. So you got out of the Air Force, and then you started your stand-up career in San Francisco. What happened to me is, I grew up and I saw, uh, see, that's what I envy about you. You're very good. You knew what you were going to want to do right from the get-go. Yeah. How old were you? Eleven. Eleven. What a, what a, what a, what a leg up. When started you, when I was 17. When you know what you want to do. Yeah. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I never thought, but I did see when HBO first came out. Remember they had HBO on location? 
Yeah, the, and, the hour specials. And the brick wall, and it was an intimate setting, and they had Freddie Prince, and they had, and I saw that, and that kind of, I thought that was kind of neat. Of course, I saw it, I think, at somebody's house, because we didn't have s s subscription television. You know, my father never paid for cable. We didn't have it either, but, you know, those old cable boxes, remember with the, it had the dial right. thing. We figured out if you put a butter knife in the little slit in the top and you wiggled it around, you could get the uh, the, the pay movies like uh, HBO. Yeah, and people like, were doctor like, dicking with the wires HBO, to their house. You, get, you, had to, you had to like get the butter knife in there, just just the perfect angle. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what was I saying about the HBO on location? Oh yeah, so that so that so so I knew about stand up, but I had no intention of doing it. And then in the Air Force in Okinawa, we took a class, a speech class. And it went really well, you know, it went really well. And then inside that class were two FEN, Far East Network uh, newsreaders for the Far East uh, Television uh, News Network in the class. So they wanted an MC for the after party, you know, and they picked me. I was like, why are they picking me? Those people are professional. They're the ones on the television reading the news. Yeah. And they picked me. So I was like, wow. Mm. So all I did is like remembered some of the finer points from all the people in the class, some of the things they had said. And then uh, we had the thing and it went, and that's where the seed was planted. It went wonderful. That's where you decided to be a comedian in Okinawa. Well, no, that's just where the seed planted. It was so much fun. Just like when you were 7 or 11, when you did it the first time, you talked about being on stage at some, at a, at a, some of where you got the, you got the bug. Did you yeah, my dad uh, took me to see my uncle do an open mic night in Washington, D.C. The entrance was next to the stage. The show was in progress. I was wearing a Washington Redskins jacket. And we walked in, and the comedian on stage goes, Hey, look, it's the coach of the Redskins. And he pulled me on stage and he interviewed me like I was the coach of the Redskins. And that's when the, the seed was... From the, the, to where the, I decided. It wasn't the seed. It was... I never wanted to do anything with my life since then. <clears throat> you know, I think I, then it was like 13, 14. It was either Major League Baseball or stand-up comedy. I might have been. Uh, and then... What position did you play? Center field. Had good legs. Could run. But... Um, once I got to high school and started seeing um, real curveballs, I, I knew that, that that was not a viable option. Right. So that was when my seed got planted at that, um, that dinner we had at the nice restaurant on, on uh, Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa. So then... Uh, <clears throat> I played Marine bases in Okinawa. Right. Uh, Camp <clears throat> Butler, Camp I, Hansen, I played Camp Schwab. Them. Yeah. I forget which one it was, but I'm on stage... And it was it was a, it was a really tough run. I've, I did that the tour twice, and some Is of this the USO tour. <clears throat> uh, USO, yeah, for uh, or uh, I, I'm not sure if it was official USO, right. but it was for the troops on the bases. And a lot of those gigs were tough and heckling. And um, the best gig, I think it was at Hanson. It's like 300 people. It's packed along the right wall. Is it was glass. The wall, and you could see outside, and there were picnic benches where people could go out and smoke cigarettes. And it was the best show of the of the run. And I'm halfway through my set, and two guys outside at the picnic tables um, start pushing and shoving each other and fighting. Please. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. And then everybody in the room got up and went outside. And it turned into the biggest free-for-all brawl I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it looked like a cartoon. There was like the smoke and like an elbow and knees and, you know, birds and stars swirling around. And apparently there's two units that were always pitted against each other. And the two guys were uh, from the opposing units. And once they started fighting, everybody had to go out and fight or else they would all get in trouble for not defending their dude. Wow. And so they were like, 20 people out of 300 who stayed and they were like, yo, keep going, keep going. But it was too fascinating not to look out the window and see this massive brawl. Spectacle. <clears throat> yeah. So what was the most exciting uh, things you saw in Okinawa? Oh, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, quite interesting. We used to drink cough medicine. 
you know, in uh, Japan, you can you can just uh, <coughs> as soon as you get to Okinawa, they say, "Don't drink the brown. Don't drink this brown." What's that? It's cough medicine. Huh. So of course everybody wants to try the brown. <laughs> you're not that you told us we can't have it. And it was uh, it was uh, you drank the whole bottle all at once, and uh, it was uh, it was quite a high. So we had motorcycles and we drove all over the place. All oh, the Philippines. That was. Uh, that was like unbelievable. Nobody ever had a cough. <laughs> Nobody had a cough. <laughs> and, uh, you were in the Philippines also. Yeah, just a uh, vacation, you know. Oh, I see. A quick hop. R and R. And that was like unbelievable, you know. That was like wild, wild west. The first time you step foot in the Philippines, you're like, wow. So. Uh, yeah, I've been to Manila twice. <clears throat> it's um, interesting place. <laughs> it's just. I did a gig there. There's a there's a stand-up gig, and <clears throat> there was a guy. I'm walking back from the hotel to the hotel, or from the gig to the hotel. This guy's got a New York Yankees baseball hat on. He goes, "Can I have some money? Uh, I'm living on the street. Can you help me out?" And his English was perfect. I went, "God damn it, brother! Are you, are you American? The guy's got a New York Yankees baseball hat on. God damn it, brother! Are you American?" He said, "No, I, but I lived in Los Angeles for many years." And I, I lived with a, a Filipino woman, and I came home one day, and I caught her in bed with another man. So I grabbed my base, shocker. I grabbed my baseball bat, and I beat the man pretty bad. And um, I had to go to jail. And when I got out of jail, they deported me back to the Philippines. And I said, "Do you still like baseball?" <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah. why do you, why do you say shocker? Do you think? Um, no, well, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, the, uh, that's the way God made it. What's that? You know, the sexual urge is just—it's uh, overwhelming. It's uh, people are in control of it. Yeah. Some people are not in control of it. True. It's simple as that. It's—it's—they're uh, not being bad. They're just—they uh, can't help themselves. And you just—that's uh, the—you know—that's just the way it is. Or else we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now. It had to be overwhelmingly. <clears throat> Strong, just like. So we're all holding and we're all maintaining and holding back our sexual urges. At Some are. Twenty-four. <laughs> I know. I know you are. <laughs> Have you ever been married? No. Never. No. How old are you? I'm gonna. I just uh, turned fifty-eight. You look good, man. Nineteen sixty-one. You don't have any cracks. You August thirtieth. Nice. So what have you learned in this life? Oh, I learned that uh, Zen is the best, best way to be. A lot of people get mixed up with Zen. They think Zen is this, Zen is that, Zen is this. <clears throat> Zen is just going with the flow. No matter what happens, moment to moment. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful way to live. Just don't be the problem. There's plenty of other people that will be the problem. Quick example, if somebody tells you something over again that they already told you, which happens all the time, all the time, just let him say it again. I would learn that with my dad. My dad would always <laughs> tell the same stories. I was like, it's so much easier to let an old guy tell the same story than to go, oh, I heard this. I heard it already, man. What are you going to do? It's like, now my dad's dead. I'm glad I let him repeat the same story a thousand times. Yeah. You know? I learned life is very short. My grandmother always told us that growing up. She lived in 92, and she used to say it all the time. <laughs> the two biggest things she said is, you hang up the towel, it'll never dry in a ball. It'll never dry in a ball, and life is short. Life is too short. And at this age, you, you realize it. But, uh, yeah. So, um, so, so is that... Uh, is that the main thing you got out of the Air Force? Meeting different people from around the world? Different people, traveling. I love to travel. I like to, uh, I like to see different cultures. In a, in, in a... I thought that the Air Force has the best uniforms. They're the, they're, they're the neatest ones. And you know what's good about the Air Force? <clears throat> the only people that do the dying are the pilots. So if you're not a pilot, chances are you will not be killed in the military. Yeah. And they'll give you all a bunch of money for college. You won't have any college debt. The military is a very, 
best kept secret. You know, no, my family. My um, father fought in Vietnam. My brother fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, I, I know it's a, it's a great way for a lot of people to lift themselves up. <clears throat> my dad was always like, you should, join the, you should join the Army. You need some discipline when I was younger. When I'd be, Thanks, Dad. I'd be surrounded by women after a gig. You're right, Dad. I should join the Army. <laughs> yeah. Leave this all behind. You're right. <clears throat> So, um, give me some Brian Holtzman wisdom, man. What's, uh, what's, what's, been, what's been brewing on your mind lately? Uh, just, just, uh, just have positive interactions with everybody you meet. Uh, I'm a big believer in if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Uh, Can't nobody stop it. And uh, just, I guess the most important thing is the moment-to-moment -moment living. You can stay in the moment, not worry about the past, and don't worry about tomorrow. Just what right now, this conversation we're having right now, that's it. And then when I leave here, it'll be another interaction. And that's it. And just go from moment to moment to moment. The people that you see that rip open uh, envelopes and rip open uh, packaging on loaves of bread, people that are driving, their, their mind is someplace else. They're not in the moment. And it's not, you know, I'm not saying it's easy. Sometimes we spin out of control. I bet you, you know, in the airports alone can make you spin out of control. Oh, yeah. When you go overseas and you've already been screened and then you want to transfer to another place and they want to do it all again. Yeah, do it again. I just got off on a secure flight. I've already been yeah. sec secured and screened. You want me to do it again? Yeah. Come on. But this is the world that we live in, you know. Yeah. It's redundant, you know. Come on, I just got off. If you don't think they did their job, now you're going to do it again? <laughs> I... So you got out of the Air Force and you started doing stand-up in San Francisco? Then I got the job at United Airlines. Okay. So I was up in San Francisco. Interesting. I had no business. I didn't want to get married. I didn't <clears> want to play house. I know I had a lot of divorce in my family. I know it's a hard road. And... Um, so I said, what am I going to do with myself? So I went to the Holy Zoo, City Zoo, and I sat around and I watched a little comedy. Because I had that bug from the Okinawa. Yeah. So I had that Holy bug. Holy City Zoo is where you started, huh? That's where I, and wow. I sat down. I remember sitting next to the girl. Remember the Brady Bunch movie? The woman who played the maid? Alice. Right. Yeah. The woman in real life who played that in the movie? Yeah. She was there at the bar sitting. I remember talking to her. Oh, I don't know who played her in the movie. Yeah. She's a comic. And uh, and she told me, you know, I was tell talking to her about it. And, uh, and she said, just, just, just do it. So I just, I just started doing it. And it was, it was a beautiful thing right from the get go. And the biggest highlight in San Francisco is on Sunday night at the punchline, they'd let the open micers or the new comics go up. Yeah. It would be like the comedy store today on Monday night. Yeah. But you get to do like a good five, seven minutes right. out of the punchline. He'd put me up last. The comedy store, they only give you like three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. yeah. And then I went up last there, and then I said, you know what? I want to put this behind me once and for all. Let's go to the comedy store. Because when I got out of the Air Force, I had passed it in 1986 to visit a friend at George Air Force Base, and the place was packed. I knew it was the Mecca, the comedy store. I went there once for the first time and they got me one seat was up in the belly room in the corner next to the wall. The place was packed. This was 1986. Wow. <clears throat> so then I then I came to Cal uh, Los Angeles to just put it behind me. But how, well, how long were you, did you... How long were, did you... 88. Just... 1988 is when I started. In San Francisco? Right. Okay. So then when did you leave there? Uh, 1989. Okay. So I moved there the next year. Yeah. Because I'm trying to figure out you gave me, when I was moving and I showed it to you, I sent you a text. I was, I had to, I had to condense some shit. I had to clean some shit out of the closet. I went through some old boxes and I found a button right. from you. It had to be 20 years old. Yeah. And I was like, I, I knew I knew Brian Holtzman before this. And it was like, I, I've always liked you. And it was like, oh, that, wow. I've met this guy before. I didn't realize it. You know? So you were in L.A. and then you moved to San Francisco? No, no, no. I moved to San Francisco uh, first. I'm from Florida. 
I, I moved to New York City when I was 20. Wasn't ready. Lived in Washington Heights for a year. Um, starving, broke, worst year of my life. Moved back to Florida for a year. Licked my wounds. And then I moved to San Francisco um, in 1990. When I was like fucking 23. Oh, so we missed each other. Yeah. I was heading south, and you, you were. And you I stayed there until I got the sitcom, and then I moved to LA to do the sitcom, '96. Man, that's great. Yeah. What was the name of that show again? You were a teacher, right? Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how, my my question is, how do you how do you arrange being all over the world like you do? Um, after the sitcom ended, I, uh, I had a lot of money and I looked at that as my NBC artist grant and I had lived in New York city like a dog. And I always swore if I ever had any money, I'd live in New York with style. So I got a rock star apartment in the wall street area, <clears throat> really focusing on, um, uh, and it was great then the comedy cellar would be like, sm you could smoke in it. It was like, you look like it was a smoky jazz club. And uh, it could still be kind of a tough room sometimes on the late shows. Yeah, they, they, all those knuckleheads from Brooklyn. They yeah. call it the Brooklyn, uh, the bridge yeah. crowd. Yeah. They come over and they're knuckle draggers. Yeah, that, that was it. You could get that sometime. Um, and then I started, I started making trips to London because my friend Rich Hall was in right. London and Rich uh, helped me. I slept on his couch and, you know, he coached me on how to get him with London. And once I got him with London, that led to gigs around Europe and around the world. And then now I've been doing that stuff for 20 years and um, I've got old relationships with people. So I just, you know, send out some emails when I want to set up a tour. So There's no agents. You do it agents yourself? <clears throat> you do it all I, yourself? I book all that shit myself. Because agents in America you. don't want, they don't fuck with the international stuff. And they don't want you doing it. Um, like poor Elvis. Elvis wanted to go overseas. And that damn poor Elvis. <clears throat> nobody could peel him away from that damn colonel. He yeah, the colonel him. fucked him. He had, oh, they wouldn't let him even get a passport. Yeah. That's at what, at what would have saved Elvis' life is if he would have just put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and went and toured the world um, playing an acoustic set. And got away from that Singing. fucking guy. Yeah. Yeah, Elvis is... I know you love Elvis. Elvis is something <clears> else. I, I listened to the essential Elvis uh, this morning in your honor. One of my favorite songs is... Return to sender, address unknown. <laughs> yeah, Elvis was unbelievable. I have a book here. It's uh, the Elvis Encyclopedia. And in that book, it's all full of Elvis facts. And in the book, I learned that Elvis was never circumcised. Um, did you know that? No. Elvis had a anteater nose looking <laughs> I'd have thought for sure he'd had a smooth, kissable German helmet. When he was on Ed Sullivan swinging it around, I thought he was swinging a German helmet. I, I never pictured him swinging around an anteater nose. A did homeless, you? A homeless dick. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know any Elvis factoids? I don't know uh, much. I know he had a nice girlfriend over there in Germany. He was never alone, that's for sure. And he got that sweet gig in uh, in the army. What was the... Um, <clears throat> I think he went to Paris once for like two days. That's it. It kills me. Um, uh, do 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 Hunk a hunk of burning love. Wow. Your kisses lift me higher. Like the sweet song from a choir, you light my morning sky. Burning love. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Yeah, he was something else. I feel my temperature rising. What was he, 42? Was that it when he, when died? he died? Yeah. Poor guy. He um, never had sex with Priscilla after she had the baby. Is that right? Yeah. He had some weird thing about motherhood. But he liked women to wrestle in white cotton panties, which I always found that a very interesting uh, footnote to the man's life. That Oh, there's Dan Brown. Look at that Dan Brown over there. Where? Right oh, yeah, there it is. 
The Da Vinci Code. That's Thailand, very good. That's the travel section. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> What's your favorite book of, of all time? Well, that Memory of Running. That's it? That's that's the only one that comes to my mind. Okay. But uh, The Red Dragon, I remember reading The Red Dragon. That uh, Another novel, I read that back on Long Island, and that was when I really... You know, you, you you know the, the the writer just paints a picture. I mean, it's it's it's. You know, that was they made that into a movie, <clears throat> The Red Dragon. I like these um, these these short videos you've been making for Instagram, where you like go on some little some little rant about something, and it's it's that distilled Brian Holtzman anger that I find um, or passion, as you point out. Uh, that I find so amusing where you'll get like worked up That's about Darren something. Carter. You know Darren Carter, the yeah. party starter? Yeah. He films I, him for you? I was with a friend over at Canners one night. I've never been on social media. Yeah. And he said, Holtzman, you have to get on social media and just make an Instagram video, one a day. And he said, they don't even have to be funny. Yeah. And when he said that, a light bulb went off in my head. I said, I can do that. I can not be funny. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> the pressure was off, you know what I mean? Because I thought, you know, uh, it has to be good, it has to be great, it can't be corny, it has to be, it's embarrassing, and I was, I was resistant. But when he said it doesn't even have to be funny, so I started it. So I st I've been doing one a day since that evening. Well, I like so I like you. You start these uh, these rants with a little factoid, and I love factoids. I love knowledge nuggets. I used to film these knowledge nuggets here. I don't know if you ever saw them. Did you hear the one about the ten home runs? The uh, no. Just the other day, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays hit ten home runs in a single game. Wow. Nineteen eighty-seven, I think it was. That wow. That's a lot of steroids. That's the record. <laughs> yeah, that's the record. Wow. <laughs> Ten home runs. <clears throat> yeah, like, you know, you were like, on this day, the General Motors Corporation was founded, GM, and then you'll go into your rant and stuff. So how do you come up with your factoids? You just, like, Google stuff? There's a, there's a, there's a website. It Happened says, on, this, on day. this day. Yeah. So I go to that, and I see if there's anything, uh, and I try to keep it out of politics and all that other nonsense. There's so much of that going on on social media. I don't want to go there. Well, that's what I like about your anger or passion. That um, it's everything in life. It's not. Um, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Um, you don't. You don't touch politics. Like it's. It's like that's so lofty. I think your your head might explode if you. Uh, yeah, you you have you have to. Uh, you I don't want to annihilate people. People are so sensitive, you know. Yeah. And you're gonna find a billion people that think you're wrong or stupid just because you said one thing. You know, yeah, that's the world. Maybe we should just See, register that guy, that, people that, that, with that, that SNL uh, guy got fired for. Oh, uh, that poor guy, yeah. man! They're really trying to suck the life right out of that this art form, stand-up comedy. They really are. They're trying to sanitize it. Well, I think he said uh, the the <clears throat> racial slur against uh, Chinese people. Yeah, but Tom, listen. Everybody has rhymes two with, eyes, rhymes with drink, two ears, <clears throat> a mouth. <clears throat> you think he said it a little too comfortably and two years ago when he said it. Did probably, you hear him say it? I heard it. Oh, so you say it's too comfortable? What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, like it's it so, too comfortable. It, it sounded a little too... That uh, he meant it? Well, yeah, he was like... Because someone had taken the audio and the audio was... Um, he's like, Chinatown's nuts. You can leave it to the... Chinks? Yeah. And we're only saying chinks because we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about this situation. So anybody listening to this podcast, put your panties back on and not worry about it. Okay, we're just talking about something else. We're not saying chinks. So he said chinks. Is that what he said? Yeah. So this is what I wanted from you. Like I, you're like all like relaxed and like we're having well. Fun. I'm, I'm we're all these <laughs> surrounded by this beautiful apartment and all these books and the postcards and the money tree and the album collection. The money I'm in tree. awe, you know. I live in a fucking trailer. All right, I live in a mobile home. Okay. Do you? Yes. No, in Redondo Beach. In Redondo Beach. I got very lucky. Forty-three thousand dollars. Bam. You People bought? spend more on that on their cars than that. No 
of shit. You bought something? I was... saw it in the LA Times living in that shithole next to Pink Dot, and there yeah. it was. There it was. Wow. I went down, I looked at it, and I said, this is perfect. Wow. I got to visit you, man. Oh, yeah. I got a nice bonsai garden and all. Really? Oh, yeah. I like the bonsai trees. I like postcards. I like books. <laughs> I like, you know, this is great, you yeah. know? Well, uh, the, 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 just to finish down the SNL guy. The drug lab. I love the drug lab the that drug you lab. have outside on the, the <laughs> patio. My marijuana farm. Uh, the dude, it was two years ago, and I think like people might think that wasn't enough time for personal growth, but um, I mean... See, but uh, anybody could have anything taken from their past and right. used against them, especially a comedian. So I and like it's not the fair. fervor that people have gotten into. Like people were upset with Bill Burr and and Chappelle over their last specials, and I think that's the the best work by those men. It's uh, they just they're just trying to to take in. You know, if someone's got two heads and you start making fun of them because they have two heads. That's a problem, because nobody has two heads. But everybody has two eyes, two ears, a mouth, and a nose. Are you really making fun of them? We're all the same. You know, we're all the same. This, you, you, you kind of see what I'm saying, kind of? Yeah. We're just people. We're all people, just so what? We're different shades, with different heights and colors and weights and, and everything. and. Uh, but basically, you know, you've got to talk about something and you've got to talk about people. Animals don't understand. You want to make fun of giraffes? Make fun of giraffes. But they're not, they're not, they won't know they're being made fun of and nobody cares about giraffes. The only thing you can talk about is people. Soylent Green is people. Yeah. You saw that movie, right? Soylent Green? Soylent Green? No. Oh, you got to see it. Oh, yeah, you got to see it. It's classic with, what's his name, uh, Charlton Heston. No, I never saw it's it. It's one of those, uh, I guess, 70s movies. Soylent Green. Soylent Green. Watch Soylent Green. <clears throat> what's it about? It's uh, uh, Los Angeles in 2022, and they're running out of everything. And it's just uh, sort of like a, bla a Blade Runner. I remember Omega Man with Charlton Heston. Right. He, he did Omega Man, too. And that was L.A. in the future. Yeah. Soylent Green. Soylent Green. It's oh, color. I'm going to look it up. I wish they would color the Jack Benny show. Wouldn't that be great if they put that in color? <laughs> right? Because it's kind of morose <laughs> when you watch it in black and white because you realize everybody you're watching is dead. Yeah. It's kind of like what? the same thing with the honeymooners. You just, it's kind of morose. There's a morose to it. It doesn't bother me. But that, 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 uh, I get the Me TV, I get the, uh, all the antenna stuff. Do you have cable? No. I got, uh, Roku. Roku? Yeah. Does that really work? It's fucking, I mean, I just it's watch uh, Netflix and then there's a couple, but you get PBS. So who's getting ripped off on that? The, the networks. I'm not paying. There's any. nothing they can do about no. stopping that. <clears throat> no, and there's a couple of news channels on there. It's like, and I don't, I don't, I get most of my news off the internet, you know? So, um, it's good. There's like France 24. I'm watching French, French news in English. The German one. Is, um, they got like a CBS 24 hour feed. And then, uh, I, I watch the PBS news hour. I mean, that's, that's probably like my main TV news. You, you know, know what the best one is? What? <clears throat> Al Jazeera. They are actually, they are actually. And All I, they do is tell you what happened. Yeah. They don't try to tell you how to think about it. Yeah. They just tell you what happened. Just the facts. I have that on Roku, and I also have Reuters. Which I, and I, when I first got the thing, I, I would look at the Al Jazeera once in a while, and you're, you're a good reminder for me to check it out. The Reuters is cool. I got it on my phone. <clears throat> the Reuters, is, really? The Reuters is cool because it'll say, how much time do you have? Five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And then, so if you only got 15 minutes, they'll break down the news in 15 minutes. That's the cool thing that the Reuters really? thing does on... Sort of like the week. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So how long are you going to be in town before you go away again? Uh, I'm here until Saturday. Oh, wow. Then where are you going to go? Uh, Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Mill Valley, San Francisco. Mill Valley, there's a theater there, right? Yeah, Throckmorton. 
Yeah, Jeff Richards played there once in a while. That's how I know about that one. Yeah, Charlie Chaplin played there in the 1890s when he was a touring vaudeville act. So you live in Redondo Beach. Tell me about... um, Tell me, do you know... uh, I'm a big fan of Charles Bukowski. Um, Are you familiar with Bukowski? The name. The guy who was... They made the movie. That shitty movie, uh, Barfly. Right. You didn't like that movie? No, it had nothing to do... He wrote this book about called Hollywood. I have his uh, signed copy. This is about the the making of that movie. And um, was he happy with that movie? No. And and Mickey Rourke had like a little on. He was like a spoiled um, movie star, and he had like all these biker dudes with him. And there was some producer that they were upset with, and all these bikers. And Mickey Rourke got on top of the dude's Mercedes and started stomping on it. And doing damage to the car, and Bukowski like wrote like what a bunch of little. If this was real life and not on the Warner Brothers set, these guys would have had their asses beat. They would have been arrested. But he was like spoiled little movie star. If the president of said corporation is judged incapable to carry out his duties because of the use of drugs or intoxicating beverages, or if he is deemed sexually overactive, detrimental to the common good of society or the corporation. Then after a majority vote of said members, the president of said corporation will be placed in a role of diminished authority, and all assets of said corporation will be divided equally among the remaining members. Okay, I'm sorry, I just opened up Hollywood and read um, the first quote that I saw. How many books did this guy <clears throat> write? Uh, he wrote a lot. And so you got a pretty eclectic collection of different... Uh, yeah, authors, but my, right? my favorite thing, you got to hear this. One of my favorite recordings of all time is Charles Bukowski live at Redondo Beach. And he's, he's, he's drunk. And half of the, you know, he's reading poems, but half of the performance, he's challenging the audience to a fight because everybody's heckling him. And he's like, hey, God damn it, I brought my knife. I'll come down there and cut your goddamn nodules off your earlobes. <laughs> and like, you'll love it. And then he's, and then people start heckling him, and he's like, "Redondo Beach, my God, who knew you guys were so tough? <laughs> You're tougher than the Detroit Gang, the Vancouver Gang, the East Lansing, Michigan Gang." But then he's he's reading his poems, and it, it's really powerful shit. So you, you live in Redondo, and you've never heard it? No. Oh my God. A guy in the Air Force told me once there's a whole world that you don't know about. Yeah. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, it's, uh, I talked to some young people and I asked them who Pauly Shaw was. They didn't even know who Pauly Shaw was. Yeah. You know, people just, we can only know what we've been exposed to. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm. So this guy was I've, a I've, 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 um, I met a, a woman that I'm um, very happy with. Are you dating now, Tom? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I met a woman. It's funny because when I got divorced, I should say this. You said uh, you came up to me and you said, you know, when you were uh, in love and happy, I couldn't relate to you. Right. But now that you're divorced and miserable, I think we can be friends. We can be better friends. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. I can relate to re- relate to you much better because. Uh, it's like a different, uh, it's like, uh, I have a friend, his name is Victor Simmons. He asked me to be the God's, God, God uh, father for his son. Yeah. So I was excited. I don't have any children of my own. I had to go to the class at the church and how to do it. Are you Catholic? Yeah. And uh, I never hear from him. Why? Because he got married? I don't know. Why did you pick me to be the godfather if you're not going to keep contact with me? Yeah. Why didn't you take the, the wife's sister's husband, make him? So I'm looking for a lawyer now to divorce my godson. <laughs> but it's not easy to do. And then, uh, you know, I'd be a big asshole if people found out that I divorced my <laughs> godson, you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, just let it go. You know, just let it go. Well, that's such a funny Catholic concept, too, to, to have a, a God parent. To like, in case if something happens accident. to the parents, then you got to raise their right, kids. Right. I mean, 
I'm really Jewish, though. Yeah. My father was Jewish, but my mother was Catholic. So you know how the Jews are. They're, they're a stickler for the, you know, the rules. You, know? you got to come out of those. You got to come from the mom. The Jewish Mom's got to be the Jews. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in all intents and purposes. Yeah, the Hindus Jewish. are like that. To be truly Hindu, you have to be born of a Hindu vagina. So that makes George Harrison the Sammy Davis Jr. of Hindu. <laughs> But can he dance? <laughs> <laughs> now, what's your favorite country? Because you've been to all France. of France. I love France. Yeah, everybody. Uh, what's his name? Is I think lives in France. The guy from uh, uh, the comic who uh, with the glasses from the Richard Belzer. How is Richard? He just he just <clears throat> left the show. He retired. I don't know he what made happened. The money and he moved to France. Yeah, he's always loved France. So he just dropped off the the face of the earth. Yeah, he's okay. I haven't seen the guy in years. I don't. I have no idea. Yeah, he just uh, when was... he did when Paul Provenza did that show Green Room. Right, that was the last time I saw. I used to be friends with Belzer. Um, when I lived in New York, when I was twenty, uh, I had when I was nineteen, I had worked with Richard Belzer at the Punchline in San Francisco, and he taught me how to um, um, sniff cocaine off of. Uh, uh, a key, which I was unfamiliar with at the time. And then when I was 20, and it was a shitty year, um, he helped me get some sets at Catch a Rising Star. And one night I got to do coke with him and Eric Roberts. Uh, and Popa Greenwich Village is one of my favorite oh, movies Eric of all time. Oh, Eric Roberts is a great actor. Yeah, Popa Greenwich Village. Him and that guy. They got my thumb, Charlie. <laughs> they got my thumb, Charlie. Oh, that's a good one. I love that film. That's a good one. That's why I liked Once Upon a Time in Hollywood so much. It's a great film. Because they're acting. You're watching the scenes. You're listening to the, di uh, the dialogue. I mean, the people talking about lunch boxes in that scene. I don't yeah. want to give it away for people who haven't seen the film. Give it away. We don't care. Talking about lunch boxes and television shows before they want to go and... Kill somebody. Yeah. I thought that movie was great just to see just to L.A. in like 69. It was like the Hollywood Boulevard with the old cars on it. And the way they had dressed up the city and... And, and the hippies who liked their bare feet. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's just he's very detail-oriented, you know? But just doing these 10-minute clips that I do, I mean, these one-minute clips, yeah. imagine making a whole movie. Yeah. No one of those directors are just out of their minds. They have to coordinate the whole thing. The wardrobe, the, the, the food, the breaks, the cameraman, the key grip, this, the light is running out of time, all that. No wonder they're just... Imagine the detail of that movie, that every everything is so detailed in that Quarantino movie. Yeah. At the end, when they're, the violent mm -hmm. end, how detailed is that? I mean, I don't know how, you know? And, uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to give the movie away, Tom. I'm sure everybody's seen it by now. You know the scene somebody where somebody might be listening. Did you ever to see this somebody? Get, from now. Did you see? Did you see them? Did you ever see somebody get hit in the face with a dog food can like that? <laughs> I mean, the way he cuts it, you know, he's like a Alfred Hitchcock. You know, he's yeah. The way it's just so fast, right? Yeah. You're sitting there, and all of a sudden, it's bouncing off her face. It just happened so fast. I mean, like I'm not. And that's how it is in real life. You yeah. know, that's how things happen. People don't walk up to you and stab you slowly. Yeah. They. You know? Yeah. I got... Uh, and, 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 the and, violence is... I mean, I, I, it gives me this nervous reaction of, of, of giggling. Like when the... the exactly. Woman, the woman who's... She's in the car and she's like, let's kill the, the people who taught us how to kill. And she goes, man. And it's <laughs> like, you want her to die when she's so evil in the backseat? And then so when she gets hit with the flamethrower in the pool... And she's flopping around like I'm. I'm not like a violent person, and I'm. I'm against violence. Oh, I, 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 I'm the same way. I, I giggled like a fool. In That's that. what's so great That's about like a him. Cartoon. He makes you laugh while you're watching <laughs> violence. Now, what, who can do that? Yeah. Other violence is like you know. I don't want to see this shit. I don't want to see this. Yeah. It, it turns my stomach. I'm not into medical reports and violence. I can't stand it. But his violence makes you laugh while you're watching it. And then it, it, when he ran away with the flame, uh, when he ran away from the pool, did you think he was running away? First thing I said is he's running away. <laughs> he comes back out with the flamethrower. Oh, yeah, no. Did you I think, think he was, he was running, running away? 
<laughs> That's great. And then they're, then they're out front talking with the neighbors. Oh, yeah, I was in that movie. Yeah, I want to come up for some coffee. Yeah, yeah. Forget about everything. It's about, it's about the business again. <laughs> oh, and then the child actor. That little girl was great. That's how they are. These 11-year-old, 8-year-old actresses and actors, they're, 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 they're highly efficient, intelligent little people. Yeah. You know, they, they speak like that. They're just... And it just came through. That's how they are. They're just intelligent. That's why we hate children a lot of times because they're so intelligent and they say things that normally you wouldn't say. But they don't have any filter. So if you got seven brothers and sisters, they got you got to be an uncle, right? You oh gotta... shit! I was an uncle in high uh, elementary school. So are you? What kind of uncle are you? You the thoughtful uncle? Or are you the? Weird... Oh, I'm the good uncle. Oh, yeah, I'm like them. Like I, I was so young, they're like little sisters. Yeah. Yeah. So what do oh, you what do you like thing. most about living in Redondo Beach? It's not next to the pink dot. It's uh it's uh, uh mobile home park is uh You gotta be a certain age to live in the mobile home park? Yeah, fifty five and above. But I got there for some reason the the owner had it, Mr. Cooper had it. Mm -hmm. And he was in charge, not as a management company, so things are a little bit different. Because my dad lived in a place like that in Costa Mesa. And Costa Mesa's all rich people, but there was this one Some of them trailer nice. park area, and my and it was my dad got in. It was a deal like that. My dad got, and it was great. It was like a, it was this hidden little mobile home park in Costa Mesa, and it was close to everything. You could walk to this same here where movie I'm theater at. and uh, nice restaurants and shit, and um, it was pretty cool. Low overhead, and. Uh, you know, I pay seven hundred and ten dollars a month, oh my God. and that includes trash, water, electric, and gas. And you bought the place you're renting? Bought it. Bought it. That's incredible. So I can take it with me if I want. Wow. What I like about it is it's close to LAX. Yeah. Something goes on with your international flight. Yeah. Just come home. I'm gonna come visit you, man. I want to see uh, when you come back in town. Do you travel internationally a lot? I like to. I like to travel. I've been to Egypt. Singapore, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Israel. I have it all on my phone. Yeah, I love seeing other cultures. You know, you, you really, uh, people would stop complaining so much here if they saw the rest of the world. Yeah, definitely. In India, on the train, I see all these people with this little bucket going near the train tracks. And then it dawns on you. It dawns on you what's going on. They're doing their morning constitution. Taking a shit. And you, and you know, that, that, that leaves you with an impression. You know, wow, we shit in water, you know, so the sanitize. We don't even smell our own feces. Yeah. <laughs> Have we ever shit not in the water, <laughs> you know, and flushed it? It's just amazing. And then you realize in the culture, and the Chinese are funny, they don't line up like regular people. You yeah. know, in America, people line up, they just gang rush wherever they're going. And it's up to you to get in there too. No one's gonna let you go first in China. But yeah, I love traveling. Yeah. They say the poorest Americans are richer than most people in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, I. I'm sure. And they're the happiest people. And nobody's giving anybody dirty looks. Nobody's giving anybody hard looks. You've been all over the world. Yeah, well, I you're so the, friendly, right? The poorest countries laugh more than we do. People oh. are in a great mood. They're not stressed. They're in a great mood. They're joking. Vietnam, China. Uh, I've never been to India. But. I went to India. I saw the Taj Mahal. It's like Niagara Falls. You can just sit there and look at it for two or three or four hours. You just can't see how beautiful it is. It looks brand new, like it was built like a couple of weeks ago. No shit. It's just a beautiful building. Now, I found most things I've seen in the world are smaller than you think it's going to be. So, uh... Taj Mahal is pretty big. It's pretty big. Well, when I went up to Dubai, up to the Burj Khalifa, the, the tallest Khalifa. building in the world. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. I've been to Dubai. I didn't go there. I went to Wild Wadi, the um, the uh, waterside park next to it. Right, right. Yeah. 
Now the next tallest building is going to be in Saudi Arabia. I'm not excited about going to Saudi Arabia, but if I want to climb the tallest building, that's where I'm going to have to go. Well, with this war that's about to kick off, I don't think they're going to. I hope they don't <laughs> kick it off. It's going to be bad news. Yeah. So, I mean, what, so what, what knowledge nuggets have you, what, what personal wisdom have you gained from traveling the world? You don't need to have anything to be happy. Shiny objects can't. The decision can't. in your mind. Right. To be happy. It comes from way deep down. And uh, it's just a big world out there. And I consider myself a citizen of the planet as opposed to the citizen of the United States. And everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to love their children, have children, love their wife. They want to eat, they want to be peaceful, and they want to be happy. And the only people that are fucking that up are the leaders. <laughs> yeah. But most people, people in Iran love us. They love us. But the people running the show, they have different agendas. Just like I don't want to get into politics, but this global warming, they want them, the ice to melt so they can get the, the petroleum, the oil, and the gas out of the ground easier. Mm. Why else would you deny global warming? Yeah. It's just, it's like a movie. It's like a bad movie, the sinister people. It's real life. It's like people with a billion dollars. Jay-Z just did something with the NFL. Jay-Z's got a billion dollars or more, right? Wow. He has no business. Uh, the NFL is using him to get over this uh, taking a knee business. Kaepernick. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't take it with you. On my deathbed, I want to just, I want to, I don't want to go fighting and kicking. I want to go peacefully and I want to know that I, 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 I did the most good and, and did the best. Uh, it's like my brother Bruce says, or anybody else says, do the right thing. There's 150 million ways to do it wrong, but there's only one way to do it right. Yeah. And uh, life's incredibly short, you know? We don't know how long we're going to be here. Well, I love your comedy because you get so worked up and you, and you, you get um, uh, passionate, as you say. So, like, what really works you up in real life? I mean, like, you're riding a motorcycle in Los Angeles? That, to me, that's nuts. Cause yeah, it's the only assholes. way to get here. People are such assholes behind the wheel. Traffic is horrible in Los Angeles. I don't, I don't take it to the club on the weekend nights. That would be suicide with the drunks. But I do take it when I have an appointment in town in the day. Because it's the only way to get here. In a timely manner. Yeah. From Redondo Beach to Hollywood, it can take you uh, over an hour and a half. Every street's got roadblocks and everything. But um, shootings, police tape. Um, so what? What really works you up in in uh, the everyday life of Brian Oldsman? I guess uh, I guess people. People. Uh, the only thing that the only thing that can disappoint you is people. And uh, you can only be hurt by someone that you love. Right. Strangers can't hurt you. Yeah, yeah that's the worst. They call it a, they call it a street angel, home devil. Somebody who goes out in the street and treats everybody like gold. But when they come home, they treat their family like shit. Hmm. Street, street, street angel, home devil. Home, uh, you know, something like that. What joke have you written that you're the most proud of? That's hard to say because, uh, uh, you know, I just, you know, I'm not real fond of jokes, kind of, you know, I have jokes, but uh, I'm more of a conversational, topical, I'll just take a talking point and run with it. So, uh, but I like to, I like to talk about what people can identify with as opposed to, uh, you know, I want them to know what I'm talking about as soon as I'm talking about it. That I think that's important. Well, how do you come up with your daily one-minute rants on Instagram? 
uh, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's why I stood on my head the other day. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, what am I going to do? Stand on my head? Then I said, yeah, stand on your head. So hopefully, like today, I don't know what I'm going to do yet today. Well, that's why I took a break on the knowledge nuggets. I mean, I was putting those out once a week, but it was hard to come up with something once a week. Oh, yeah. And uh, my wife and I, um, we'd film it and the we did it in natural lights, like the sun would be going down, and she'd be like, you gotta drop this, and you need to move that to the end, and I was like, well, fuck it then! We won't put one out this week! <laughs> and then, like, like, it was like... <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean about yeah. making a movie and doing yeah. these one things. You can get... It, it's nutty, because you just want to get it over with. You know, it takes a second to film a minute, but it takes a half hour to load it up, yeah. pretending on your internet where you are, you know, to, to feed it. But uh, yeah, it's frustrating. I can. Well, you want to do something good too, and then yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes you're not. Yeah, ready you, for you know, it's it's hard to top. Uh, I did one with that uh, Nicole Tran, that comic from Vietnam. You know, you just have to realize you can't top it. There's some things that can't be topped. What was that one? I didn't see it. She speaks Vietnamese. Yeah, and uh, she's my lawyer because I'm suing the. Uh, Morning Glory uh, uh, Sparkler Corporation for burns I received on 4th of July. <laughs> so we go to LAX to drop off a friend who's going to the Philippines. I said, you want to be in the video today? Meet me at the Bradley Terminal at 9.45 if you want to be in the video. Sure enough, she was there. And that's a real, that's a good one. So, like you said, it's it's tough, you know. You have to come up with it. You know, we don't have twenty writers. Yeah. Or twenty five. Did you watch the roast of Alec Baldwin? No. Me no. neither. No, but I I saw um, uh, Jeff Ross doing his jokes at the Comedy Store and Nikki Glaser right. doing her things for the roast, and they were they were jokes that a team of writers had given them. Oh, they don't make their own jokes? They write some of them. But like At Midnight, when I did At Midnight, you know, you'd, you'd come up with some of your jokes, but like for the, for the answers you didn't, they had like a list of jokes that the writers came up with and you could just pick the ones that you wanted. And I thought, oh, I thought everybody wrote their own thing. Uh, and then I would, you know, try and write my own thing because on some of the things the, the writers... Um, the, uh, the weren't as strong as other jokes. Right. Yeah. So what's the greatest advice you've ever been given as a comedian? Just have fun. Yeah, it's important to have fun. I think what I'm doing, and I think a lot of people are doing, perhaps yourself, it's, it's that time when it just works, that zone, they call it the zone, I'm calling it Zen now. When the audience and your brain and your audience are all on the same page and everything you say just works and you can't even make it work. It just happens. Just like we're talking right now. And I think that's what I'm chasing. Because if it went terrible every time, you'd stop doing it. Nobody goes bowling if they don't know how to bowl. Right. Why would you go bowling if you suck at bowling? You wouldn't want to do it. I think we, it's important that we do things that we like and have fun at. And if you're having fun at it, maybe you're good at it. So when you get that zone, it's like nothing else in the world. And plus, it's great to make people laugh. Because you can't, it's like a sneeze. You, it has to be genuine. Nobody can fake a laugh. Yeah, true. Except me and my videos. <laughs> that you was know? a fake laugh. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you know, you're such a great character. Uh, I mean, have you, have you done a lot of acting? And then it's like, you know, you always think like, there's that that misperception about Hollywood that, you know, you're just going to be discovered and invited to do something. Like, I, if I was, where are the movie and television people coming to the comedy store and going, God damn, Brian Holtzman would be perfect for the older man who's had enough with society. and Well, uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully it's, <laughs> that'll happen but um, you know this business takes a lot a lot of 
groundwork and grunt work. You know, it's. Uh, I think I've grunted enough. I'm. I have a friend <laughs> who's. I have a friend whose brother is uh, Tom Sizemore. Who was that? Uh, Tom Sizemore, the actor in the Heat, Saving Private Ryan. Isn't his name Tom Sizemore? I don't remember. <clears throat> and he told his brother, he says, "What do you think they're doing? Handing out movie star tickets at the LAX? You think you know how he? You know?" It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, I like to do some acting. I did some sitcom work, four episodes. That was fun. I didn't, I didn't particularly, uh, I don't know how I pulled it off, but uh, but Damon Wayans asked me to do it personally. Okay. I never had to audition. See, that's the biggest hurdle, the audition. Yeah. That cold reading is, is it, it's an art in itself. Yeah. It's very difficult, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, it is what it is, you know. Uh, Life is too, uh, like, you know, it's too, uh, too, uh, too immense to, uh, you know. What, <clears throat> what do you want the rest of the world to know about Brian Holtzman? That deep down, deep down, he hates everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he only cares for bonsai trees. Oh, bonsai trees are so cool. 200-year-old 200, 200 tree looking like a regular mature tree. In, in half an inch of soil. <laughs> That's life, huh? I used to have one by the time. <clears throat> You're going to be like <clears throat> Mr. Miyagi to some kid out in Redondo Beach teaching them how to do comedy. They're all healthy. Yeah, I just tell people, uh, I tell people if you're on stage and you don't know what you're saying or your material's not working or you know, just say what's exactly on your mind. Say what's exactly on your mind because the truth is always funnier than anything we can manufacture. Yeah. Don't tell Jerry Seinfeld that. Yeah, and then and your real stories about your life can't be taken away from you. Like, people can copy jokes of yours. Like, it amazes me. I'll, I'll come up with a joke and then I'll see, you know, like a, a, a TV show or, or or something. And I'll be like, God damn it, that joke's like my joke. Yeah, I but bet like, they come in the club. Nobody can steal your fucking, your real life stories. Right. They, they, they bet they come in the club and take notes. All these people writing on shows and stuff. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure it's um, it's no coincidence. No. So in closing, do you have any words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to give to the people of the earth? Be happy. Be thoughtful. Be conscientious. And always want to be missed. You don't want to be the person that's like, I can't wait till that person leaves. <laughs> I'm happy that person is gone. Be missed. And uh, keep an open mind. And, and don't hate. Life is too short to hate. You don't hate nobody? No. What you do is if you hate somebody, what you say is you don't like their style. And that loses all the bitterness and the toxicness of hate. You don't want hate running around in your veins. Hate is a toxin. You don't need it. I got it. I don't like my brother's style. Exactly. <laughs> How many brothers do you have? Two. I have two, too. They're both pea brain fuckwits. They're not enlightened, perhaps. Right. I don't like their style. <laughs> Yeah, never, it's just you don't like their style. The way they punch me and yell in my face. Oh, you're the and youngest? Gets, and get spittle in my eye. <laughs> I don't like their style. Yes, I'm the youngest, and they've been throwing me around like a rag doll my whole life. Well, yeah, I don't like their style. Just say you don't like their style. <laughs> I don't like their lack of compassion for other human beings. And flush the toilet, too, when you're done. <laughs> flush the fucking toilet. That's what, that's what someone needs to do with this country. It's, uh, the toilet is clogged, and Trump is just the turd swirling around at the top. And But you're going to talk to people, and I have friends. I'm still friends with them because they have the right to their, you know, their racism, their arrogant, uh, 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 ignorance, their racism, uh, you know, whatever is causing them to believe that perhaps he's doing a good job. And... Uh, it's, it's just the same thing. It's the same broken record. They're hurt people. They feel like they've been left out. They're, somebody's treated them wrong, perhaps, in their life. Yeah. 
and there's uh, there's a deep seated kind of resentment. Maybe it's how they look, how much money they make, how they were treated growing up. There's something going on, and and to be a positive person with uh, like a small child, all I can do is compare it to a small child. When you were young and you were just running around, you had no access to grind, you had no racism, you had no uh, anger, you had nothing against anything or anybody. And if you can get to that point as an adult, then you're living a Zen life. Hmm. I mean, even as chilled as I am, I haven't achieved that, that Zen. Like I said, But I... you get better and better because you're going to find yourself catching it. You got to give everybody a break because you don't know what they're going through. The yeah. guy who's racing around is probably could have somebody in the hospital with the, yeah, with cancer, and they got stuff on their mind. Yeah, you got to give people all. As long as they don't physically molest you or attack you in any way, you give everybody a pass, and it's easier said than done, because people will do things that will uh, make you. Uh, but it's okay if I choose to spend my Christmases with other people, right? Well, you can only... Uh, I might be about... spending Christmas this year in Redondo Beach. <laughs> right. I'm going I'm I'm to bring little tiny ornaments for the bonsai trees. Can I give my Instagram account? Yes, I want you to give everything right now. Hmm. Brian Holt, It's at Brian Holtzman, right? Uh, the Instagram is Brian Holtzman. H-O-L-T-Z-M-A-N. Right. And uh, and it's Brian with an I, not a Y. Thank you. Because he wasn't born after 1990. And uh, this is a great, there's so many nice things in this apartment. I just want to make sure the days that you'll be out of town. I'm a collector. <laughs> you'll come back and everything will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> like the Grinch with the sled filling it up. And you're going to have yeah. a dog pulling it. But, uh, Brian, I absolutely love you, and I love watching you work, and as fucked up as some people can be in life, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I love and value comedians above everyone else, and I really get excited when I see you're on the bill, and I love watching you, <laughs> because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what you're going to talk about. You never bang through the same shit, and you're always, it's always this, it's... It's it's I guess it's that nervous laughter of watching the Tarantino movie. I get I kind of <laughs> I kind of get that when I watch you is like holy fuck is it is this guy about to uh, pull out a gun and murder everybody or is it or maybe the, maybe your rants are the reason you don't. I prefer pull out a flying. Gun. What do they call them? Throwing stars, stars <laughs> and nunchucks. <laughs> Well, thank you, man. That's a great compliment. And I'm happy that you had me because I'm a big fan of yours as well. I mean, you've, you've got a lot of miles on your ass and TV shows and uh, concert halls all over the freaking world, man. A beautiful residence. So uh, thanks for having me. You're welcome, brother. I respect you and I, I, I love you as a comedian and as a person. So right. long may you run, brother. Thank you. Long may you run. Tom Rhodes, your funny man. Tom Rhodes, you're an international comedian. Tom Rhodes, karate kick, baby, oh yeah. Tom Rhodes, you're a groovy dude. You go all around the world, telling jokes to all of the people. You are an international comedian. Funny to everybody in every single country in the world. Tom Rhodes, I like you very much. I think you're talented and very wonderful. Tom Rhodes, you're the best guy in the world. I wanna be your friend. You should call me sometime. Here is my phone number: six zero three six four four zero zero four eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Rhodes. You're an international comedic sensation. Tom Rhodes. I like to listen to your podcast. Tom Rhodes. You're the best man to ever walk on the earth. <laughs>